for the longest while, we presumed there was stuff flying between the stars. That's right. But nobody ever saw one because occasionally you'd expect them to pay us a visit. Or, yeah, or, or at least pass through. Pa- pass through. That's what I mean. Yeah. They just come in and go out. And we've been looking for centuries. Yeah. And your main topic of study is something that doesn't exist yet. Oh, <laughs> well, no, I was pretty lucky because so when I was a third year graduate student, I was doing just pure fluid dynamics for astrophysics. And then as a third year graduate student, a muamua was discovered. So just to be clear, so a f- fluid to an astrophysicist is a what? A gas. Mm-hmm. A gas, right. exactly. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes. So, uh, so liquids and gases are both fluids to, to a physicist. Right. Right. That's okay. Right. So then why does a muamua have anything to do with fluid dynamics? Well, it doesn't have too much to do with fluid dynamics, to be honest, but it was such an exciting opportunity that we just kind of dropped everything else we were yes oh, we dropped everything else we were doing and we started working on that basically this thing got discovered and it was also moving super fast right. so it was only observable for a couple of weeks from ground based telescopes and then upwards of 3 or 4 weeks would wins. you expect it to be moving fast if it's coming in from interstellar space yes you would expect it to be moving fast. And why, why would it be faster than anything else? So because the planets are all moving in the same direction around the sun, mm-hmm. Oumuamua comes in and it's coming from a totally different direction. And then it looks like it's moving really fast compared to our motion. Because we're going in opposite directions yes. to each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oumuamua discovered with telescopes in Hawaii. That's a Hawaiian word for first scout, basically. So that, as it came through the solar system, we said, all right, we know what trajectory an object with that speed and that direction coming in should take as it rounds the sun. Then there was the actual trajectory, which was different. Like, whoa, whoa. Well, comets have a way of outgassing when they get near the sun, and that puts an extra little sort of force on their arc of motion that has them move in ways that are not purely gravitational. And that's true for all comets. So we said, maybe it's outgassing. But suppose you look and there's no outgassing. So what's going on? Well, that's fun. We don't understand it. Not initially. So what's your first thought? Is it aliens? That could be. Like I said, it's not my first thought. It, I promise you, it will be my last thought, but it's not, not in the list. It's in the list. It's just way down based on the history of trying to understand things that we don't understand. We have two more objects that have come through and they have some weird properties, the brightness, the rotation rate. And so they don't match some of our models for what comets and asteroids should do. Whatever anomalous behavior these objects exhibit, I'm delighted that they're finally in the catalog. And we'll figure it out one day, maybe. Now, you said it was hyperbolic. Tell me what you mean there. Because some people are hyperbolic. Mm. (laughs) A different sense of the word, hyperbolic. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So it's the flavor flavor of comics. (laughs) Of comics. We knew knew it was hyperbolic because it was like, yeah, boy. (laughs) So it came into the solar system and left, and it's never coming back. Because hyperbolic means that its orbit is not bound to the sun. We found this thing. Yes. Called it Oumuamua, which sounds Hawaiian. It does. It is Hawaiian. I think it's, was it discovered by a telescope in yes. Hawaii? So it was picked up by PanStars, which is a telescope in Hawaii that is funded by the Department of Defense, and they're looking for near-Earth objects. Okay. So small kilometer scale objects that small. some of which, small yes. Kilometer scale. <laughs> small, yeah. yes. It will knock you on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah, exactly. <laughs> So some of those objects are potentially hazardous. So we, it's very important that we find them with ample time to do something. If uh, if they're going to hit us, exactly, with ample time to kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you need enough time to get that right. out of the way. Well, so it seems to me, from what you say, PanStars had no expectation of finding interstellar objects, but it has the ability to do so regardless. Is that a fair statement? What happens to get them to be kicked out so that they're now slingshotted out into, hey, I'm on, see you, I'm on my way. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, and it's a good question because we also don't know the answer. But, uh, <laughs> so the, Stop asking a guest <laughs> questions he can't answer. Chuck. But the most likely thing is you basically have something like a deep space maneuver for a spacecraft where you slingshot off of a planet, but you have that with something as big as Jupiter. I mean, their version of a Jupiter. Right? Yeah, yeah, their right. version of a Jupiter. So something with Jupiter's mass at around five astronomical units. Then if you get, if a small body gets close to that planet, it could get slung shot out. So Jupiter is like a proxy sun or a, a Jupiter type. It acts like like it would be the sun. Well, it messes with the oh, it, it messes with the orbits and right. things. That yeah, yeah. it's yeah. more yeah, it's more like when you get close to Jupiter, you start feeling its gravitational influence much more than the sun, and then oh, that will change your gotcha, orbit. Gotcha. So the things that formed at large distances from the sun, they have ice in them, which hasn't evaporated away exactly over the years, eons. Yeah, exactly. So when that a comet gets close to the sun, the ice will heat up and sublimate, producing a dust tail. And that produces a bright, beautiful cometary tail. You can't say evaporate. Yeah, can't. Say oh, right, it's sublimates. Word. Sublimates <laughs> yes. got to use the real so, word. Well, of course, yes. <laughs> you know, to regular yeah. folk, it's just it's evaporating. It's, yeah, exactly. But right. no, uh, sublimates. Yes. Remind us what sublimate means. So that is when the ice in a well, not just in a comet, but when ice transitions straight to the gas, gas. form, straight ice. straight away without yeah. melting in between. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they call dry ice. Oh, okay. That just. Smokes away. That right. You've never seen liquid dry ice. No, have you? no, you haven't. Right. It goes right to the. And now, ladies and gentlemen, coming to the stage. <laughs> uh, it goes right straight from the ice <laughs> to the smoke. To the smoke. <laughs> we expected that the interstellar objects that get ejected from other planetary systems, that they most likely would have formed at large distances and then had a lot of ice in them. So we'd expect them to be comets. Is that because if they form at a large distance, they're not strongly held? by the gravity of their host star. Yeah. So they can be knocked off. That's exactly right. Okay. And if they form at far distances, then they haven't been close enough to their host stars so inactive, which means that it doesn't look like a comet because it doesn't look like it has a tail. It doesn't reveal fluff. That's fluff. exactly okay. right. But then we realized as we were trying to get follow-up observations with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope, that the object had a non-gravitational acceleration. So Spitzer is specializes in infrared. If I yes, correctly. that's exactly okay, right. Good, good. Yeah. So you want to you want to combine different tools out of yes. the toolkit of the observational astronomer mm -hmm. to see it in as many ways as you can. Yeah. Okay. And Spitzer is really great. Like looking in the infrared is really great for comet science for some of the same reasons you use it for things like exoplanets. But because you can see typical cometary gases like CO two and CO that you wouldn't be able to see from the ground. So Spitzer named for Lyman Spitzer. Oh, okay. He's a former chair of the astrophysics group at Princeton University. Ah. And I have one of his books on the I, show. I was going to say, you sound like you know him. <laughs> <laughs> the way. Yeah. So I keep interrupting you. No, that's okay. Yeah, keep going. Go. Essentially, it had this non-gravitational acceleration, but no apparent dust coma. And then an important point is that these non-gravitational accelerations, we see them on... So first of all, what that means is that the object... You look over time at its position in the sky, and then you figure out its orbit, and then you realize that its orbit could not be explained just from the sun's gravitational influence. So there must be an additional force acting on it. Mm. You want there to be fuzz if you're going to be non-gravitational. That's right. So because that's, you're in a conundrum. Yes. And there is another kind of important point, which is that you will also see asteroids accelerating non-gravitationally. It's just that their non-gravitational accelerations, for example, they can be caused by solar pressure, radiation pressure. They're much, much weaker. So a Muamua's non-gravitational acceleration, the weird thing is not that it had one, it's that it had one with no dust coma, but it was much stronger than those that could be Typical operating on an asteroid. So our hypothesis not theory. <laughs> <laughs> he thought about it too. He was like, so uh, yes, Howard, uh, I'm going to say it because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The hypothesis is that there was water, water ice in Muamua, but then as it travels through the interstellar medium, it's exposed to these very high energy particles called cosmic rays, and that will break down some water and trap hydrogen in there. And then as the ice heats up as a muamua comes through the solar system, it will just gently release this trapped hydrogen. Which has a greater impulse to, yes, to accelerate 
the object than, That's right. than just evaporating water would. That's right. So it's both the fact that hydrogen is a lot lighter than water, but also it takes much less energy to sublimate hydrogen than water. Yeah. So this is also kind of based on this student who's been working with me, who's just starting, just started this last you year. You just got out of the, graduate yeah. school and you got students already. <laughs> Good for you, man. I love it. Mm, man. So that's Aster Taylor, who had a paper published that discussed the possibility that the water, that dark comets could have brought water to the earth. So, More so than other comets? All right. Well, there's, so people used to think that comets delivered water to the earth and we still don't know where the earth's oceans came from. And part of the reason that we're now not sure if comets delivered the water is because we have spacecraft, measure, spacecraft measurements of water in comets, like the Rosetta mission went to 67P and some of the isotopes, which is some of the things about the water in that comet did not match that that we've measured in the, in the Earth's oceans. This would be deuterium. I yes. Guess, right? Yes. So yeah. that's one of them. So the deuterium yeah. to hydrogen ratio. Yeah, so hydrogen is just one proton in the nucleus. And the protons define what we label the element to be. So now you're throwing a neutron. Okay. It's still hydrogen, but now it's like a little heavier. Right. So you can't just, it's got to be hydrogen, something else. Something, you're going to be, you got to you need, you need, you need something with the, with, the with the name. Right. And so we call it deuterium. Right. How stable is deuterium? Well, it's not that it's stable. It's just the important thing is that the amount of deuterium compared to hydrogen isn't going to change from processing. And it depends very critically at the temperature of formation. It won't change chemically. Right. So if the comet doesn't match that in the oceans, you can't credit the comet right. for delivering That's the correct. Water. So okay. we don't know for sure, and Aster was very careful to say this in the press releases and news articles about their paper, but we can't say for sure that dark comets could have contributed, contributed water to the Earth, but they are a new, entirely new population of small bodies that a are in source. the new source, nice. potential source. The Rare Rubin Observatory and LSST, which I'll probably refer to it as, is coming online just next year. Farrah Rubin, another astrophysicist, mm -hmm. uh, died a few years back. She uh, discovered dark matter in galaxies yeah. back in the 70s. So we named a whole observatory after yes. her. And this is an observatory that, unlike any other, in what important way? Right, so it is coming online right now at the beginning of next year. That would be 2025. 2025, right. What's the observatory going to do? So it's going to observe the entire Southern Hemisphere almost every night. So it'll be like pan stars now, which is in the Northern Hemisphere, but it'll look almost every night to see anything moving in the sky, but it goes almost five orders of magnitude more sensitive than pan stars. So five powers of 10. Yeah. So we'll be finding many more moving objects in the solar system, and we should be finding many more interstellar objects. I, I think like people Luamu. don't appreciate. For that to work, it would have to be ultra thin or ultra low density. So Amaya Moore Martin at Space Telescope has this idea that it was an ultra low density fractal aggregate, which basically means it's a very large snowflake. Essentially, in the last couple of years, since Oumuamua, we've discovered these seven objects within the solar system, which are oh, near-Earth oh. objects, actually, which is what Oumuamua was initially... Uh, they thought it was a Neo? It thought it was a Neo, that's right. Mm -hmm. You're picking up on the uh, abbreviation also. <laughs> so they thought it was a near-Earth object. So these are near-Earth objects which are bound to the solar system, unlike Oumuamua. So they have elliptical orbits, not yes. hyperbolic orbits. That's yeah. correct. We discovered significant non-gravitational accelerations on all seven of these objects, which are also inactive, which means that they don't have comet-like tails. Oh, okay. So therefore you wow. can't credit the normal comet non-gravitational outgassing. That's right. But the accelerations we found on these dark comets, or, I mean, dark comets is just a ma name I made up. I mm -hmm. hope, I think people like it, but... That, How could you not? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these objects, essentially their non-gravitational accelerations are too strong to be explained by the... Similar to Oumuamua, the accelerations you see on other asteroids. 